Welcome to the, this Grattan Institute conversation, uh, Who Dares? Can Australia Embrace the Bold Policy Agenda After COVID? Uh, I'm Danielle Wood, CEO of the Grattan Institute. I am dialing in today from Boomerang country. I would like to pay my respects to the elders of this land and all the lands from around the country that people are joining us today. Uh, I, I do think it's important that we recognise uh, in a webinar on bold policy agendas that, that we still have a long way to go in the process of, of reconciliation with our First Nations peoples. Uh, constitutional recognition remains on the to-do list as it has been for some time now uh, and equally you know, the need for more effective policy collaborations to, to make progress in closing the gaps on health and education and economic outcomes. Uh, we, we might touch on some of those issues today but we are going to be talking about policy reform more generally and particularly what the policy environment might look like in the coming years. Uh, what we are not going to do is talk about COVID policy and, and, and how that might evolve in coming months. I'm, I'm sure many of you will sigh, sigh, do a sigh of relief to that one. Um, but, but clearly the context is we are in the midst of a pretty extraordinary period in Australia's history. Um, it's a period where political leaders have made some very bold decisions, uh, I think decisions that would have been inconceivable to, to almost all of us two years ago, you know, shutting international borders, shutting state borders, um, keeping us in our homes for 23 hours of the day, spending some pretty eye-watering sums on emergency supports. Uh, and, and in a period of upheaval like that, you do see some shifting in the tectonic plates of politics. Um, you know, we saw a period of close collaboration between a Liberal IR minister and a union leader. Um, we've seen ebbs and flows of cooperation between states and federal governments. Um, some periods of constructive bipartisanship on policy decisions uh, and a big rise in trust in, in politicians for the first time in more than a decade. Uh, so what does it all mean? Will our leaders be emboldened by COVID to continue making big decisions on the other side or will we return to business as usual? What might be on the policy menu in terms of building back better? Uh, we, we've obviously touched on some of these questions before in previous webinars. Um, we've heard from former um, leaders of the public service, top integrity experts, uh, but today we're going to come at it from a different lens. Uh, we are lucky enough to have one of Australia's best political commentators and thinkers to shed some light on these questions. Uh, Dr. Peter Van Olsen is Network 10's political editor. He writes a weekend, uh, he writes a weekly column, I should say, for the Weekend Australian. He co-hosts the Sunday Project with Lisa Wilkinson and appears regularly as a panelist on ABC Insiders. Peter is a professor of politics and public policy at the University of Western Australia and Griffith University, and he has written six books on Australian politics and a new one that we are going to be talking about today. Uh, Who Dares Losers, Pariah Policies, uh, fantastic title, very interesting book. Uh, he's co-authored that with Wayne Errington. Um, welcome, Peter. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Fantastic. Um, I should also say to everyone, I'm really sad that um, Laura Tingle is not able to join us today as advertised. Uh, I spoke to Laura about half an hour ago. Um, she's unfortunately very unwell uh, and, and certainly not in a state to give her uh, usual incisive commentary. So we wish her a speedy recovery. Um, Peter, as we can all see, is in robust good health. <laughs> so the show will go on. Um, so the, the way we're going to run today is pretty standard format for us. Peter and I will have a chat for the next 20 minutes or so. There'll be lots of time for audience Q&A. Uh, we do have um, a big crowd on the webinar today. So my suggestion as per normal is put your question in early uh, and I'm much more likely to be able to see it and ask it if you do that. So feel free to shoot through ideas um, as we are talking. Um, so Peter, Let's start with a really big picture. Um, you're obviously an experienced watcher of politics in Australia. Um, do you think this period of disruption that we are going through will herald a new approach to politics? Uh, and, and in particular, do you think there will be this period of increased boldness on the policy front? Sadly, I don't. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think that it's going to be a return to some version of business as usual, at least for a little while. Uh, it's possible, I think, in a few years' time, when there's a real crunch moment in the wake of COVID, hopefully we're in the wake of COVID in a few years' time, I think there's a possibility then that we do get our act together in a policy sense and then there's a little bit more boldness, but not immediately after. And the problem with that, if I'm right, is that it means that one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to have a re-elected coalition government in a fourth term not doing all the things that it needs to do, uh, to be able to you know, give us the best chance post-COVID in terms of policy settings. And no doubt we can talk about what some of those options might look like. 
But almost more concerningly is that if we have a change of government, I don't think that the Labor Party in its first term will, will also be prepared to be big and bold. It will be more bold, I think, than the coalition would be if it gets re-elected, in no small part because it's the progressive side of politics and they tend to be more bold, but also just because it's a first-term government uh, and first-term governments we know are much more likely to actually do things than fourth-term governments, for example. So uh, there will be a little bit of that, but not enough of it. So I think it's more likely to emulate uh, the timidity that we saw in the wake of Kevin Rudd's government being elected or uh, the partly forced on timidity in the wake of Tony Abbott's government getting elected uh, after 2013 because of you know commitments pre-election that they weren't able to then ram through post-election. So I don't see us entering a period in the next 12 to 24 months that emulates, for example, uh, what happened after Hawke and Keating certainly got in where we saw really major reform. I think we're in a similar time now. I think we need it. Uh, but I don't see it happening. Uh, and I even don't see it being a version of what happened when John Howard won in 96, whether you agree or disagree with the policy scripts. You know, he, he had a little bit of a do-nothing approach to, to some areas, not industrial relations, but then he had gun reform forced on him and then obviously he took GST reform to the subsequent election. I, I don't even think we'll have that level uh, of, of change coming. So, you know, for people who, who are over uh, uncertainty uh, and change, they, they might see that as a good thing. I don't, because uh, I actually think that the policy settings now, uh, in their own way, uh, have broad-based similarities to the times that we faced in the early 80s when we were crying out for the kind of microeconomic reform that Hawke and Keating went after. Yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. So where, um, and we'll come back to those policies, obviously, but, you know, where do, where do you think that timidity comes from? So why why is is so different to those previous elections you were talking about. I, you had a line in the book, I think it was, um, winners aren't reformers. Um, you know, why Why not? Why can't you win with a reform agenda? Uh, we, we blame everyone uh, in, in the book, uh, including ourselves in a sense, or certainly myself. Wayne doesn't have to carry the, the mantra of being a media commentator, but we blame the electorate, we blame the political class, and we certainly blame the media as well. And it's a chicken or the egg discussion of which one came first. At the end of the day, it's the political class that has to have the courage of its convictions, even if you blame all three. But it, it's a triumvirate of failure uh, in our view. So you have, if you like, uh, an increasingly reactionary media, uh, which goes for the soundbite uh, and is beholden to the 24-hour news structure. Now, that's been the case for a while, but it's becoming more prevalent, I think. And that, in turn, uh, is feeding or fostering a timidity amongst the political class where they're about election for election's sake, for example, uh, or they're worried that if they go down big policy agendas, they will lose favour very quickly. Partly the fault of the media with the way that it covers it, partly the fault of the adversarial nature, the hyper-adversarial nature of modern Australian politics, where you rarely see on big ticket items uh, the two major parties agreeing, uh, rather they see the opportunity to disagree. Uh, and it's funny, actually, because growing up, watching and studying uh, and learning from some of what happened during the Hawke Keating years, it was normalised to me that you would have an opposition that would agree with at least some of the big picture parts of the puzzle. Uh, and I know that Labor people like to make the point that there was a lot of contestation then and it was heady days and there was a lot that the Liberals in opposition disagreed with and I, and I accept that. But there was also a lot on the big picture reforms that they agreed with. And we haven't really seen that since. Uh, so we still had a figure from that era in John Howard try to do some change when he finally got his turn in, in a smaller way. But now those figures are all gone. And it is the political class, if you like, searching for populism and searching for a sort of win for the sake of winning cause. And then you go to the voters as the third, you know, sort of leg of failure here. And I just think that the public has a bit of reform fatigue amongst older generations that should be now pushing for reform because they were younger living through what various iterations of it looked like in the past. But also now it's a sort of infotainment era uh, where voters are easily persuaded um, by short-term electoral cycle moments. And it just makes it so hard for either major party to do enough to change. And, and I, I then also look at who goes into politics when I'm critical of the political class. I think even though we have at one level more diversity, which is a good thing, uh, we also have a lot less of it in terms of breadth of sort of career and, and you know, the, 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 the Labor side doesn't have 
a level of representation by the union movement that it once had, uh, even if it's got other forms of diversity. And on the coalition side, the Liberals in particular, but nationals in their own way, the Liberals don't have that diversity from small and medium-sized business backgrounds that they once had. So it's much more a, a role of apparatchiks all round. Uh, and I think that feeds into the sort of win for the sake of winning ethos. You know, it was good to have Graham Richardson as a figure for Labor to be able to have the whatever it takes mantra, but then you needed to have him surrounded by other voices with other perspectives than just win at all costs. Uh, and now I think you have more Graham Richardsons and less Hawks and, and Keatings, uh, and that applies on both sides. Yeah, it's really, there's some um, fascinating research from the Parliamentary Library on that kind of tracking the uh, pre politics careers of, of various um, parliaments and it definitely um, does pick up that phenomenon that, that more and more people are coming into politics from some sort of political background rather than kind of broader walks of life and you know I can, I can see how that contributes perhaps to a um, as you say a kind of win at all costs and a, a risk aversion as well of doing things that that could cost you. Um, let's Let's move to talk a little bit more about kind of the the content of, of policies now. Obviously, you've got prior policies in the name of your book um, and, and you talk about policies that you think are probably a good idea but have for one reason or another become untouchable in Australian politics. Um, tell us tell us a bit more about those, Peter. What, what are those policies and, and why do you think that they could be a good idea in the wake of COVID? Sure, and I should probably stress as well that from both Wayne and my perspective, uh, we don't necessarily advocate all the policies that are in the book. We make this point you know, in the introduction. Uh, we just simply say that there are ideas that are absolutely worthy of debate uh, and it's only at the end point of having that debate that you can make a really informed judgment on whether they are worth ultimately pursuing or, or junking after serious consideration. The, the point about a lot of these policies for us is that whether it's other parts of the world or through academic research, they're worthy of debate and discussion, but we don't even get to that first hurdle with these ideas, and that's part of the problem, right? You can't have that debate uh, about ideas without it becoming a sort of a blinkered partisan perspective on it, uh, a scare campaign, if you will. So, you know, what are some of them? I mean, we deliberately raised the issue of, of death duties as one because it was a classic case of uh, a policy that Labor did not take to the last election, yet it somehow got campaigned on um, by Scott Morrison and the Liberals uh, as a scare campaign for no other reason than Andrew Lee, uh, who was the shadow assistant treasurer, had just made a passing reference to the possibility of death duties being something that governments could look at uh, in one of his books from his days as an academic at ANU. And then all of a sudden, this was therefore uh, a raison d'etre uh, as far as Scott Morrison was concerned that he could attack Labor about. But we actually think death duties is something that uh, could be considered and should be considered. It's it's kind of there globally uh, in a lot of parts of the world uh, and it doesn't have to be done in an absolutist way. And indeed, we used to have death duties at the state level um, and it was Joe Bjorki peterson uh, who abolished them up in Queensland and as a result, retirees flooded there for more than just the sunshine uh, and then all of a sudden other states started one by one getting rid of their death duties. So we talk about it in the context of doing it similarly to how the GST is done uh, at the federal level, but then uh, perhaps dispersed to the states where we know that there's obviously vertical fiscal imbalance and there's uh, revenue shortfalls at the state level. So that's just one uh, idea that's in there. Uh, we talk about uh, the possibility of taxing the family home uh, as, as another idea. Uh, you know, we also look at a third way uh, of doing climate policy, uh, given the hyper-partisan way that it's transpired. We even look at the idea of um, not commercialising the ABC. We don't go quite that far, but certainly looking at the idea of commercials on the ABC and some elements of, of what that could then foster in terms of public interest journalism as well. So we, we, we go through a range of ideas and we only really touch the surface. Um, but the, the point of the book, as I stress, is not to say these are all good ideas. It's to say that they, as well as many, many others, are worthy uh, of debate at least and consideration. A sin tax is another one. You know, the idea of a sugar tax is, as an example of a sin tax, uh, which has got a little bit of coverage in the last 48 hours. So, you know, we just sort of put these forward uh, as, as new ways of doing business and also make the point that even though a lot of it just sounds like more taxes, uh, it becomes a way to restructure the tax system where you can then cut other taxes. And we, we, we kind of lament the fact that you never seem to be able to have one of these holistic debates anymore where you're discussing tax reform writ large, it always seems to be piecemeal 
Uh, and when it becomes piecemeal, uh, then tax reform gets confused with tax increases if you're just picking up one or another singularly rather than looking at the whole breadbasket of how you do it, do it differently. Yeah, look, and that's exactly the question that I wanted to, to come to on that tax front and um, we've certainly, I've, I've sort of dipped my toe into the water on death taxes before and, it, you know, it's, it, I, I feel sympathy for political leaders because they are, you know, even though economically they are pretty good taxes, um, the, the sort of the public reaction is always pretty strong. I went and did some talkback radio on it and um, I, could, I could see why a politician wouldn't want to go back there again. Um, but, you know, so that, that point you make about, you know, this is not about increasing one tax. You've got to think about the system um, holistically. I mean, it seems to me we've, we've had moments in recent decades where people have tried to do that. We had the Henry Tax Review, which is still kind of the, the benchmark for, for looking at reform to the tax system. We had um, a lot of people forget this one, but the, the Abbott government started both a tax and federalism mm. review process. And they had actually a really great discussion paper they put out felt like there was a lot of momentum and, and then it sort of well, fizzled out when um, Turnbull became leader. Um, you know, could we have um, another sort of push like that and do you think it could potentially go somewhere in the current environment? I think we will eventually. Uh, I just think we're going to be a little bit late to the party on it. One of the things when I've sort of studied Australian history, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Australian politics is that we seem to have partly by virtue of, of our good luck, but, but also by virtue of our good political leadership, I think we've managed to hit reform moments in time rather than too late. Uh, it got pretty close to being too late by the time Hawke and Keating were going down the path of reform that they were, but it wasn't too late. And so they set up or helped set up the prosperity of the decades to follow. Uh, and, you know, by the time Whitlam finally got in and did some massive social reform, I think it was overdue but it certainly wasn't too late in terms of where Australia and the world was at uh, socially conservatively at the time. So I think that's been a real virtue of this country is our willingness to get it done in time. And once upon a time, if you go right back in Australian history, uh, we were much more daring, you know, uh, around being early adopters to electoral reform, giving women the vote, you know, all these sort of things. And that's completely fallen by the wayside. You know, we're at the point now uh, where it seems to be okay to have, you know, all elements of non-disclosure and not even in, in terms of political donations, for example. Uh, and it's also, you know, almost just rooted in as accepted that the electoral system is what it is rather than it could of itself be reformed to help foster policy change. So we went from being a dynamic country when we were young in some respects to then at least still being virtuously uh, a country that would get reforms in time. My fear now is that even though I'm an optimist that we will reform eventually, I think that now we're going to be playing catch up. Uh, so the time is either now, uh, three years ago, or within the next three years for, for the optimal time for us to do a lot of these restructures around federation and tax as, as two primary areas. But I don't see it happening until the, uh, the electoral cycle after that. Uh, and then I wonder which side of politics it even is that does it. And I wonder who it is that's even in the parliament potentially yet uh, who then has the courage to do it as well. Because I think that's part and parcel of the issue. You know, you have, you, when, you, when you change the structure of the political class and narrow who goes into politics in terms of their pre-parliamentary backgrounds, you have fewer uh, political leaders of the ilk who are prepared to crash or crash through who are in the ranks. And even if there are a few of them that get a chance here and there, they're more likely to crash than crash through, even if it's just with their own party room much less before getting a chance to do it with or without the public, uh, with, a, with a media that's, you know, constantly at them uh, in a short-term focused way, as well as the new world of oppositionism that we live in. So I, I don't sound like an optimist when I put it all together like that, but I guess what I'm saying is first-term governments are, are where the rubber hits the road on, on serious reform. And, you know, that time is long gone for this government, obviously. I don't see an Albanese... Labor Party doing it, as I mentioned before, even though I think they would do more than the current government. Um, but to have a real bite again at tax and federation reform as, as, as two key drivers that incorporate a lot of the policies that we talk about, frankly, in the book, uh, I, I think it's going to have to be a government further down the road. And what is that? Is that a, is that a re-elected post a Labor period in government, Liberal coalition government? And if it is, who and where does the heart of that party sit by then? Uh, if it's Labor, it means that they have to lose the next election. And then the question becomes, well, who takes over? 
you know, who are we looking at in Labor's ranks to actually have that level of boldness? Uh, there are a couple of names there I could imagine doing it, um, but I just don't know whether they win the debate or whether it gets to a point where they do more of what Rudd did when he came in and just run a bit of an it's time argument and then get in uh, and then make a meal of, of going down the path of major reform. I mean, he did the Henry Tax Review, but then, you know, had a, had a quick go at implementing some of it, uh, far from all of it. And then, of course, his own side of politics tore him down and, and then they came up with a botched version of the mining tax as one example uh, and, and junked most, most of the rest of it. And they got unlucky, obviously, having a GFC on the way through. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So I want to come back to the institutions question later because I, I think that's incredibly important. Um, you were touching there on leadership and kind of who, who's who's the person. Um, one of the, um, we had lots of questions sort of submitted um, before the webinar. So I'm going to bring in one of those here. Um, Charles Agnew said, do you think the revered leaders of times gone by, Whitlam, Hawke, Keating, Howard, could have succeeded in the current political climate. So is it just that we need one of these great visionary leaders or is it just this, this climate that, that's holding them back? Yeah, that's a great question. I, and I, I think the, the answer, which I don't mean to um, step around it because I'm trying to answer it, but I think the answer is if you put, for example, four you know, great leaders of the past who, who did achieve major policy reform of one form or another, whether you agree or disagree with it, the difference now is you can at best have the opportunity of that. So only two out of the four of them would probably even get there um, in the first place because of all the barriers that exist, whether they even get into parliament or whether their colleagues would entrust them with the leadership. Uh, and then only at best one of those remaining two would be likely to succeed at the implementation stage, I think, um, unlike in their own era where they were able to because of all the barriers that we talk about, their own party, the voter and the media as well. So in other words, we're going to see the regularity of it, I think, uh, at a rate of somewhere around 25% of what we've seen in the past, which is one of the explainers of why we're going to be late to the party rather than ahead of the curve when it comes to needing to get reform done. And we're going to see less of it, not more of it. Uh, and that carries all the inherent risks to our prosperity going forward, if, if I'm right about that. So that's my attempt to answer it. Three out of the four, without naming names, probably never would have succeeded nor been known by name. Uh, and, you know, at best, maybe one of them would have been able to do it. Uh, and, and what kind of a country would we have looked like had that happened? You know, a vastly less prosperous, uh, less, you know, I don't like the word egalitarian in terms of how we frame it, but we wouldn't have had the social structural changes that we that we needed under Whitlam. We wouldn't have had the microeconomic reform that we needed uh, under Hawke and Keating. And, and I believe we wouldn't have had the industrial relations or indeed tax reform and gun reform that we had uh, under Howard and would have just had a snapshot of all of it. Yeah, right. Well, I'll, I'll leave everyone to speculate on who's the one of one of the four, but <laughs> thank you. That's great. Um, another question on, on leadership from Marcus Barber. Um, I think this is a really interesting one. So how do, how do you actually talk about a bold policy agenda with, without trying to signal first the, the kind of future you want to create? Um, so he points to Finland, Singapore, Philippines, um, other countries that have deliberate foresight platforms that extend beyond electoral cycles. Um, how do we get there? Yeah, I, I think there are two parts to that. Uh, one, I think, is electoral systems. So I, I do think that our electoral system is decreasingly fit for purpose um, in sitting alongside major reform. So the, the adversarial nature of it in conjunction with what I now see as the increasing hyperpartisanship um, and intolerance uh, almost of the other in a way, which, which reduces um, courage when it comes to policy. I, I think that's a factor. Uh, and it's why it's one of the reasons why I sort of referred before to electoral form, electoral reform is, is one of the things that we we're really dynamic about as a country in our younger days. So I, I think electoral reform is one of the really important things that has to be on the table for us to be taking broader policy reform seriously, because I think without it, the policy reform becomes much, much harder. But the other factor that I think uh, we can't ignore is that once upon a time, and this is a, a, something to blame the media for, once upon a time, well, I guess, um, once upon a time we had a, a situation where in opposition you weren't absolutely nitpicked in what you did or didn't say 
and having it held against you when you got into government. In other words, yeah. Howard in opposition didn't flag what he went on to do in government. Um, we had a broad idea of who he was because he'd been in politics for so long, but he kind of avoided ever flagging it for fear of being undone by Keating in another successful election campaign, tearing the coalition down like he did in 93. Hawke and Keating certainly didn't flag the microeconomic reforms that they pursued uh, once they got their hands on, on the, the Campbell Review, uh, which you know Howard had done nothing with during his time as treasurer. Uh, he claims because Fraser wouldn't let him, um, but who knows? Either way, it was gathering dust on his bookshelves. So they, they didn't flag it in opposition. They just then went about doing it once they were in government. Uh, Whitlam was a little different, but even the extent of what Whitlam did wasn't flagged um, before he got into power, not the extent of it. Now, the reason I think that's important is because the media climate has changed. You know, more is asked of oppositions uh, and more is held against politicians with what they have or haven't said pre-government to when they get into government. And that has all manner of effects. I mean, the first one is uh, oppositions tend to rule things out now if they get pressed too hard. And then if they turn around and backflip on it like Abbott tried to do in government, they get absolutely torn limb from limb, politically speaking. Uh, and it's not that when you hear that, that it's unreasonable because it sounds pretty reasonable. But what I have a problem with, with that or where I think it's a problem for policy development is that oppositions have so little capacity to develop good policy. They've got limited resources, no access to the bureaucracy, um, and, and then they're thrown into the partisan world of politics. So expecting an opposition to come up with anything that's even partly formed, much less fully formed, is only going to mean that what they come up with is not good. Uh, and then when they get into government, what happens then? Do they press ahead because they promised to do it? Uh, do they refuse to do all the things that they ruled out before they had the apparatus of state at their disposal, which then tells them actually these things have to be done because they're really important? And, and that's where the system is a problem. And, and that comes back to the electoral system. To some extent, it comes back to our political culture that I think has increasingly evolved in recent decades in this country, which, which, um, which feeds that approach of expecting too much from opposition and therefore stifling in government um, by holding politicians accountable for what they've ruled in or out in the past. I mean, we, we did see in the 2019 election, though, an opposition um, go to the polls with a pretty fully formed um, policy agenda. I, I think it was. It was pretty bold. There was a lot. There was certainly a lot there. Um, you know, how... What do you think um, the, the Labor Party has taken away from, from that experience? Well, yeah, and, and, and they lost, right? And so <laughs> one, one of the problems is they, um, they might have learnt the wrong lessons from that. Uh, well, certainly if you believe in bold policy reform, they learnt the wrong lessons. Uh, they in part lost because of the agenda that they took, but then they in large part lost because there was um, a charisma deficit with the leader, uh, there was a government able to tear apart uh, not just the policies that they were running on, but then their extrapolation of what those policy positions were to the point of um, downright deceit about what they were. Uh, and so the lesson learned, unfortunately, was, I suspect, not to go down that bold path again. Uh, and, you know, I, I like the fact that the shortened opposition was prepared to put all of that on the table. I don't actually like the fact that they were absolutist about it as an agenda that had to be done because once they get their hands on the apparatus of state, maybe they would have found that the way they'd structured negative gearing wasn't quite right and it could be or should be tweaked. Or maybe they would have developed a different view on dividend imputations once they were able to put their policy through the strictures of a public policy test process in government. Um, but the lesson learned, I think, is that you know, oppositions shouldn't go big. Uh, and if they go small, then inevitably the media will start asking them to rule things out, which they will do. Uh, and then what do they do when they get into government? Uh, at best, in their first term, they might be able to get away with it. one massive backflip if it's based around a process. Uh, and if they do it a little bit more deftly than, for example, Tony Abbott did uh, when he did a version of that. But it, it's just, it's it's narrowing the window, isn't it? Uh, on okay. On time that governments and political leaders have to get something done. And that's also part of the issue is that these political leaders of today, uh, they, they come and go, uh, you know, in a way that they didn't do in the past. You know, you never would have dreamed of some of the figures who have become uh, Prime Minister lately after the period that they've been in public life getting to that position that quickly. Anthony Albanese is almost a bit of a throwback, actually. 
uh, as somebody who's been around a long time before getting to the position of opposition leader. You know, Shorten, a very different situation. Morrison, a very different situation. Mm-hmm. Rudd, Gillard, same thing. Uh, so that that's that's its own factor, I think. And it probably, if you think that voters are already distrustful of politicians and you think that uh, the media is already very hypersensitive in, in looking to nitpick, I, I think in a sense that almost makes it worse because then the figures that are trying to get public trust haven't built it up over enough decades uh, in political and public life. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at that trust data and I think, I mean, the other way it plays in clearly is, um, you know, people see those changes of leaderships about, you know, being about parties, think about themselves and their own ambitions rather about the problems of the nation and that itself is kind of fed into the distrust. So the, the sort of the initial big fall in trust in politics came after um, Kevin Rudd was removed in leader in in 2007 and or 2008, whatever it was. Anyway, we've sort of seen a sort of slow decline since then. Um, just on, the, I just wanted to pick up on the point you were making about um, oppositions not having resources. And, you know, I think it's sometimes good to acknowledge some good things that have happened in, in public life as well. And I think one of the really positive institutional changes we've, we've seen in the past decade was the introduction of the Parliamentary Budget Office. Mm. Um, so what that does is actually give... Um, oppositions, minor parties, any parliamentarian can go to the parliamentary budget office and get it policy costed. Um, and that, I think, you know, did contribute somewhat to the boldness um, of the Labor platform in that election um, because they're not going to get called on having a black hole in their costing. So that was always the risk in the past. You put for, you put up a policy, you don't have the bureaucracy there. Um, government runs it through Treasury and tells you you're, you're a billion dollars short. Um, that's pretty devastating, um, and and that's sort of taken that component out of the, the equation. Um, so yes, they don't have access to the full bureaucracy, but there are some institutions that are helping with that, which I think has been a really positive for for policy development in this country. Um, I want to come back to policy, Peter. So we we talked a bit about tax and federalism. Um, climate policy uh, came up in the pre-submitted questions more than anything else. I can see there's a, a question on it. Um, from John K. Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung, um, which has also had a lot of votes. Um, and th- they all kind of distill down to the same question. Um, you know, is, is anything actually going to happen? Is there is there a way through to sensible policy here? Um, obviously, a very live policy issue um, in the lead up to the, the COP conference. We've, we've seen some significant moves from state governments, including the New South Wales government yesterday. Um, but we've also seen, um, you know, a lot of um, conversation from the Nationals this week about some of their reservations on moving. Mm. Um, do, do you think there is a way through for the government on this? And then maybe we'll talk about Labor after that. Yeah, look, I, I, I suspect they'll come up with something that they can uh, stitch together sufficiently to get through the next election, whether they win or lose the election. So I, I, I believe that's where Scott Morrison's going. But that's that's just about politics, isn't it? That's about trying to stitch something up that mm. allows them to say, you know, here's our target, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're not Neanderthals on this, um, but equally we're not so bold as to fracture our own side of politics. So let's let's put that behind us and campaign and make the focus of the election other things. I think that's what their attempt is going to be to do. Uh, whether they're successful or not, uh, we will see. In some respects, I think what any federal government does, and this is part of the point of um, governments of the modern era being behind rather than ahead of the curve, in some respects I think that the, any federal government's response to climate change is almost at the point where, you know, they, they are becoming passengers in the move, aren't they? Because, as you mentioned, state governments uh, are putting um, things in place, uh, private organisations are putting things in place, and they're, it's it's a stifling impact not having a, a more coherent, tangible federal policy to help knit that together. But ultimately, it's happening without them. But I just think it happening without them means that we are, by definition, becoming laggards on climate policy reform uh, and we are not being our best selves in terms of being able to set the national economy up for it. Uh, where, do, where does it go? I, I suspect that uh, the, the forces in the National Party stifling change are going to become fewer and further between over the coming electoral cycle or two. Uh, and I do think that there is going to be a rearguard, and it's starting now, a rearguard action from moderate Liberals uh, within the Liberal Party. And I think that's one of the things that Scott Morrison, again, getting back to the politics of it, he's aware of as well, 
uh, you know, he will do whatever he thinks achieves him the best political outcome in this space. He doesn't have any sort of passion for or against climate change action, as far as I can tell. I think his passion is whatever will be politically fit for purpose for him to win an election. Uh, and I think part of that for him is seeing that Liberal moderates uh, like your Jason Falinskis and, the, and your Dave Sharmas uh, and Trent Zimmerman, I suppose, as well. These guys, are, and, and it's a much broader array than just them, they're starting partly for their own electoral survival, partly because they have views on it. They're starting to make it clear, as I can tell, inside the Liberal Party, we are not going to be silenced internally on the promise of something happening one day just to get us through an electoral cycle. They're starting to make those soundings. Um, but again, all that does is drag Scott Morrison to a position of trying to cobble something together that gets him through the election. How it looks in the aftermath of that is anyone's guess and, and probably comes down to what the electoral map looks like to some extent. How does he win the election and, and where does he win it if he does? Uh, if he loses it uh, and if he loses it big time, well, then it's a completely different debate because you've got a Labor government having been quite clear for a couple of electoral cycles on where it sits on the issue of climate change and climate change action. And I think that could then in the aftermath um, be a repeat of what we saw when Rudd tried to go down that path, but without um, the, the, the uproar that followed it. You know, it looked then like we had a consensus when Howard and Rudd were both arguing for an emissions trading scheme of one sort or another. Rudd wins and it just seems like a fait accompli. And then it was just about design principles in a debate. That was a false dawn. I think a version of that will come if Labor wins handsomely at the next election, because I don't know that Liberals' 2.0 defeat would, would be quite in a position to do what they did back then on that particular issue. I think they would give up the, the space and move into some somewhere else. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it feels like we're even further away, though, than the previous time in the sense that, you know, we're, argue, we're arguing about targets now and, you know, how ambitious to be. But we're not even at the point of arguing about what's the policies to get us there, which, yeah. you know, is pretty <laughs> extraordinary. You know, the days that you can imagine parties agreeing on emissions trading scheme, you know, it's, it's <laughs> mind-boggling. Well, and, you know, I'd, I'd encourage anyone interested, which I know is a lot of people from what you're saying, um, to, to go back and have another look at the Stern Review. Uh, it's fascinating reading this number of years on uh, both as being something that was put forward from a conservative perspective in the UK uh, and then seeing where they are versus where we are, uh, it's it's kind of mind-boggling, frankly. Yeah, do you, I mean, I remember those days um, I was an economist working at the Productivity Commission and we would have heated debates about whether you'd have a, you know, a carbon tax or an ETS, you know, and those, you know, that seemed like the, you know, incredibly important distinction. You know, nowadays you kind of sell yourself for either, frankly. And, well, and, and, and that also spoke to a real moment in time, I think, in the media. And, and I was guilty of this uh, too. I, I like to think less than some others, but nonetheless, you know, all guilty as charged. We, you know, Julia Gillard made that utterance. Uh, ahead of the 2010 election, ruling out a carbon tax. Uh, it was much more nuanced than the line that always got used, but we all use it uh, as though there was no nuance. Uh, and what she instituted wasn't a carbon tax anyway. It was a fixed price designed to shift, as you well know, to a floating price, a la an emissions trading scheme. Um, but it just had to necessarily, by virtue of policy design, start fixed before moving to floating. And so it wasn't actually that that purest definition of a carbon tax but you know that that was the way it was portrayed that's the nature of 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 the modern media uh, and we all have to do better um but you know who's going to go first you know in, you know in a world where the media is so much more challenged in terms of its business model and journalists trying to file across multiple platforms with multiple deadlines it's it's the worst conceivable environment to ask more of journalists um even though it's probably never more necessary than it is at the moment yeah, great point. Um, now, we, we've come back to institutions now, maybe. So you've touched on electoral reform. Um, we are also getting a lot of questions coming in um, around donations, federal ICAC. Um, what do you think needs to happen in this kind of integrity space to, to, to make policymaking better? Oh, look, I mean, I, I, a host more mo uh, elements of transparency uh, is a no-brainer, in my view, as a, as a policy script. The problem, of course, is that both sides of politics between the major parties have a vested interest in not pursuing significant donor reforms. Uh, and even the concept of a federal ICAC, uh, it's, you know, it's embedded Labor policy. The, 
government for years have told us they're, they're doing it but haven't done anything yet. Uh, ultimately, if it gets legislated late by a coalition government, it, almost if they think they're going to lose and, they're, and they legislate it, that's probably your best chance of the coalition creating one with teeth. Um, as long as it's forward-looking and, and isn't allowed to be retrospective, because then it becomes something that's set up as a as a as a sandpit of failure for an incoming Labor government, right? If the Labor Party gets into government uh, and then fulfills its commitment to have a federal integrity commission of some sort, uh, they're likely to make it more toothless once they're in power than they might be advocating for when they're in opposition. I know I sound very cynical, but I suspect that that that's true. Uh, and donation reforms are something that you know. Uh, again, the parties will uh, will advocate for reform only insofar as they're at the very least not disadvantaged between one another, uh, and ideally so that there is a sort of almost cartelization of views when it comes to political donation reforms. That is to say, the major parties will collectively, implicitly form a cartel to exclude the kind of reform that minor parties, independents and academics might be advocating for because it doesn't suit them and it risks um, puncturing the two-party system if the reform uh, is, is too great. So, I mean, I would like to see all manner of changes there. I'd like to see um, political parties not be completely exempt from privacy legislation uh, that other private organisations are not exempt from. I can see some grounds for why parties need exemptions, but not to the extent that we now see someone like Clive Palmer taking advantage of. Um, but the major parties want those exemptions so they can run their own electoral databases, just as one example. Uh, you know, there's all these sort of reforms that they're never going to be willing to embrace. And then the holy grail at the end of all of that is the kind of electoral reform that would put more proportionality into the system, uh, in my view, at least. Uh, but there's no way that two parties in the most rigid party structure, in the most rigid two party structure with um, partisan tendencies within voting elements there as well, that you're going to see uh, either of those major parties advocate for an electoral reform that might send us in the New Zealand model or take in some of the elements of continental Europe. There's just no way. And all of that is before you even get to the political cultural change that would be required, because it's one thing to bring about proportional representation reform, which I think is a good thing, but it needs to come hand in glove with that cultural adjustment to embracing coalition building and uh, consensus building when it comes to policy ideas and, you know, horse trading that isn't just literally total pragmatism in the horse trade. Uh, it has to be about stitching together more than just that. And, and we don't have that political culture at this point. And I don't see us moving in that direction anytime soon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame Laura's not here. Her um, quarterly essay on, on New Zealand and what mm. we think of some of them has some really interesting observations around proportional representation and, and you know, what that's done for the culture there. Um, just, just to come back to donations reform, and, you know, I agree with your points about the barriers, but I think something really interesting is that we've seen the states move a lot further on these sort of things. So most states now have, you know, far better disclosure mm. regimes than the Commonwealth in terms of political donations. We have a couple of states that publish ministerial diaries so we can have visibility over who ministers meet with. Um, you know, why, why do you think it is that the states have been able to push forward where the Commonwealth hasn't? Actually, that's a good question. I, I, I don't, off the top of my head, know know what the answer to that is, other than maybe the stakes. Well, I was about to say the stakes are, are higher at the federal level, but I'm not even sure if that's true, actually, because the kind of policy decision-making is quite granular at the state level. Uh, and may, maybe that is the answer, because policy decision-making at the state level is perhaps, in a way, so much more at risk of, you know, um, influence of lobbyists or special interest groups in, in a very direct way, whereas at the federal level, the influence is there uh, and the money matters to the politicians, but it's not quite as direct. You know, then the planning decisions and so forth that state governments make are, are so much more at risk of really hyper corruption uh, if, if you don't have, you know, levels of checks and balances in place to, to prevent it, whereas federally it, it's a bit... <laughs> It, it, it's a bit less What's tangible, right? yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe that is is one of the reasons um, that f at federally they. I mean, I do know from you know from conversations I've had on the coalition side, one of their worries as they've been looking at structuring uh, a federal integrity commission is trying to get it right so that things that they don't think equate to corruption 
get pinged as coming across like corruption. So they're worried about, they've been worried about the optics um, adding up to something uh, more definitive than the reality of it. And whether they're right or wrong about that is, is not really my point. My point is that I can see how that stifles their, um, their support for doing it and getting it done. I think Labor will not be entirely dissimilar to that if they're in government looking to institute um, a, a, an integrity commission at the federal level because then all of a sudden self-interest is much more at the heart of, of the process. Yeah, indeed. It's much easier to get people to tie their hands in, in opposition um, than, than once they're there themselves. And I think, I know, I think that kind of uh, distinction that some people draw between, you know, we should only be worried about hardcore corruption um, versus maladministration and politicisation of um, public money. You know, I, I, I really question that distinction, but yeah. uh, that's, a, that's an important debate, I think. Um, well, and that comes back to the culture, doesn't it? Because it's, a, I mean, I completely agree with you on that. Uh, and, and the fact that that's what I've heard from inside the government about why uh, they're, if you like, going slow on their commitment to an integrity commission, that speaks to a broken uh, or, or, or a, a very dark political culture, doesn't it? Because they're only worried, you know, basically as long as you don't break the law, that's the line as exactly. far as they're concerned. And it's got to be better than that, you know. <laughs> it's got to be better than that. Uh, I've got some upcoming work on this, so stay tuned, everyone. But, um, yeah, well, I think I think we should, we should be better than that. Um, now I'm just going through lots of questions coming through. Peter, um, interesting one for Nicholas Jackson, and questions are moving as I'm scrolling down, um, about the role of the public service. So do you think the public service has been neutered and is this constraining bold policy reform? Uh, in a word, yes, uh, I think it has. But I, I also don't think that the public service is, is and, and it's partly cause and effect, but I, I also don't think the public service is what it once was. So you've almost got like these two elements without um, without mounting my case for who's to blame for this. I don't, I don't think the public service in the broader sense is as good as it once was. Uh, it's better in a lot of ways. Again, diversity is a key one, but I, I, I think that the, the rigour of the public sector uh, as, a, as a career isn't what it once was. And I think that's partly goes to my second point, which is that uh, absolutely, you know, um, free and frank and fearless advice is not valued the way that it once was, either inside the public sector, where, where there are more political appointments than there used to be, or indeed outside, uh, if that free and frank and fearless advice even gets to a minister now. Uh, and then, of course, it rarely gets to a minister a lot of the time because ministers have ministerial staff who often now act as much as gatekeepers um, as anything. So you don't tend to have, you know, the, what, what the public service does come up with, even if in that best case scenario, uh, it is completely frank and fearless and, and doesn't get captured by, by politics on the way through, uh, how does it ever get that advice to uh, mm. the politician and the minister? And even if it does get it to them, you know, how many out of X number of ministers are even going to be prepared to be bold? Uh, and even if they are, how are they going to convince their cabinet or their leader who falls into the same trap that we've already talked about? So all of that feeds up the line, but then it also feeds back down the line, I think, towards a public service and it discourages recruitment. Uh, it, it, you know, there, there are more diverse opportunities outside of the public service now. And while I don't entirely disagree with the ability to build careers that come and go between private and public sector as a theory, uh, in practice, uh, I, I've almost done a 180 um, from, you know, the, the days of, you know, uh, other than the lack of things like gender representation, the, the days of the Sir Humphrey Applebee's of this world uh, are almost ones I long for now um, because at least he, you know, at least he's not interested uh, in just serving the master who's the politician. He's got all sorts of other faults, um, but one of them is not just trying to serve the partisan interests of the politician and, and that's to, you know, that, that's a, that is at least a virtue in between all of his other vices. More yes minister in <laughs> Australian <laughs> politics, love it. <laughs> Um, so I've got a, a very probing question for you, Peter, from Claire Brown. Uh, she says it's refreshing to hear Peter talk about how the media needs to improve the quality of his work, including its own performance. Uh, what will he do differently? That's a good question. Um, the, look, it's, it's really hard because let me put it this way. 
Uh, and, you know, I, I, this is why I have a sort of a sympathy for journalism uh, not bettering itself. When, when I do nightly news packages uh, on Channel 10, at best I get two minutes. It's very hard to say anything uh, in two minutes uh, and, you know, your battle and, you know, obviously that includes grabs, you have to sort of follow the politics of the day to a large extent and it's a big deal as the political editor not to just do a story on the political story of the day but to give that to a member of your team and then find something else that you think is really important and write about it, uh, write to it and then broadcast it. And even then two minutes becomes a minute 30 and maybe you don't get past your uh, your executive producer and even getting it in the rundown. So I know that sounds like a, a woe is me tale, um, but on a, in a broadcast media sense, it's it's hard to do anything other than roll with the cycle. I try not to, uh, and, and I would argue genuinely that compared to other political editors, which is not to have a go at them, but I think Channel 10 lets me be a little bit more outside the box on all of that, which I really like, uh, and I have to just remind myself to answer the question. On a daily basis, I have to remind myself not to just take what I consider the easy path, which also happens to align with what your bosses want, which is just to follow the news of the day. Um, so that's a daily reminder. Uh, in terms of comment writing, because uh, I don't do much news writing for the newspaper anymore, but com you know, opinion piece writing, again, it's not being um, guided by clicks on the page because, you know, clicks are guided by being controversial and that means being a little bit loose uh, in terms of, you know, casting aspersions and, and all the rest of it. Uh, you, you know, you, you've to write about policy, I, I get half the readership uh, when I see the stats that I do if I do a leadership column uh, or if I complain about borders, you know, or, you know, Back when Tony Abbott was Prime Minister, you just had to put Peter Credlin's name in the headline and then that doubled your readership straight away because there was controversy. So reminding yourself not to think like, you know, a ratings machine as, or an equivalent to that is a really important thing to do. Um, ultimately, I think the biggest contribution that I'll be able to make um, will actually be however many years from now post my, you know, full-time foray into the media when I'm going to be able to write about it out the other side of it when as I plan to go back to full-time academia in, you know, probably five years or so from now. Um, but then will anyone in journalism then write about what I write about or will I be, uh, will, will I only be talking to, to colleagues and the few who are interested um, mm -hmm. rather than the many where I have a microphone at the moment? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a very welcome answer, I suspect, to the question, um, but it's very, very hard uh, to do anything other than just be part of feeding the beast. And, and, and that's why I have a little element of sympathy for the politicians as well, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, when they've tried to buck that trend, they often find themselves on the wrong side of their colleagues or of the voters or indeed the media. Oh, that's, um, look, thank you for being so honest and, and really reflecting in that way. I mean, I was really interested in your point about the, the clicks um, when you write about policy versus, um, you know, more controversial leadership topics. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, to what extent, and I don't know if you feel comfortable saying this, but is there pressure on you then as, as a journalist to, to respond to those numbers? And are you benchmarked on those numbers? And Yeah, it, look, it, it, I'm happy to talk about it. It's um, I've never been pressured in any direct way, if I could put it that way. So, um, so far at least, touch wood, uh, I've been lucky enough at The Australian that I've never been told what to write. Uh, it's never been suggested, but I'm an opinion writer and I sort of came in sideways from academia. So mm -hmm. I, I can't speak to whether that is or isn't true for younger journalists who work their way through and who are reporting news, not doing commentary like I am. Um, but no one's ever told me what to write uh, and no one's ever tried to steer me towards, you know, sexier topics uh, that get more clicks. But what has changed over the 12 years that, that I've been at The Australian and particularly in the last couple of years is that, you know, they're obviously a business and they're trying to at least not lose money and ideally make money, um, you, you get a daily report uh, on everyone's articles uh, and how many readers each has had and how many subscriptions have been, um, have been garnered from, from each column, um, you know, because they can work that out, I guess. And no one ever said, to me at least, no one's ever said, hey, yours are down this week or you've been down for four weeks, nothing like that. I suspect the day that um, they stop asking me to write will be my learned moment that my clicks must have gone down. Um, so it's all a self-regulating thing for me uh, and maybe it's a different experience for others. Um, but I guess that 
pressure sits there now because once upon a time that was always a big secret, what the clicks were and and all, all of that. So you kind of, if you wanted to play to that, you were flying blind anyway, whereas now I can just see it I, and I, I can almost guesstimate what my numbers are going to be when I finish the column rather than when I get the results in because I'll know, you know, based on the topic, what is likely to hit and what is likely not to. Absolutely fascinating. I think it's it's hard, even even if you're not directed, to sort of not be responding to that as a just as a human being that likes hitting KPIs on, on some level. Um, and, and and I was just going to say, I, I have it's sort of, uh, and maybe maybe I'm becoming too tolerant of failure uh, in this broader sense. But I, I kind of just like how I'm 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 very negative on where you know the media, the voter, and the politician are at, and and all the reasons behind it. But I'm also at the one by one level of of each editor of a newspaper or news director of a television station or journalist or politician or voter for that matter. I I have a sympathy for um, the challenges that we all and they all face because, you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of market driven in a way. But, you know, you you also have to try and and see it, it, it becomes just a job if you're only market driven, doesn't it? Uh, whereas, you know, I, I feel really privileged uh, to, to do what is my passion. Um, and you've got to remind yourself that, you know, that comes with a responsibility not to be driven by, you know, sort of market particulars, but it still sits there uh, and, and it undeniably has to because of the nature of the same reasons that, you know, businesses are beholden to shareholders and, you know, everyone's beholden to their boss. But you just have to try to mitigate where you think lines are about what's important and what's not. Yeah, it's a very interesting tension between what are essentially our businesses, as you say, and and but obviously serve a really important public interest function. Mm. Um, and I know, and we didn't, we we've run out of time unfortunately. But I know you sort of touch a little bit on the book about you know what what role policy might play in supporting public interest journalism, and you know there's a really big and important topics as well. Um, so look, I do need to wrap it up now. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today, um, and a huge thank you to Peter. Um, it's it's a big job uh, to be the uh, sole panellist for, for one hour and to answer so many questions. Um, so thank you for, for being um, so incisive um, and, and, and so open and honest with your answers, Peter. We really, really appreciate the discussion. Um, for those of you that care about policy, um, Grattan's going to be putting it together its own uh, policy wish list for bold reform in coming months, um, drawing on our 11-year back book of, of policy research. Um, so we'll be putting out what we call the Orange Book in the lead-up to the federal election um, that sets out, you know, what we think are the really big and important policy changes um, in the areas that we do our work, so health, education, transport and cities, energy and climate, uh, economic policy, obviously, and institutions as well. Um, so do look out for that in coming months. Uh, if you like independent policy experts researching and advocating for evidence-based policy, uh, please do consider supporting Grattan. You know, it's it's with your support that we're able to keep doing this research and keep putting these ideas in front of governments. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us again and, and have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.